It's March the 31st, 2022. I'm Chris and this is Curiously Polar. And we're back. And with we, I mean myself and Mario. Hello. Mario. <laughs> yes, hi. Huh. Yeah, yeah. We lost Henry again. Henry. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> He's preparing for the Arctic season, so he had to go and do a lot of practical yeah. things, like doctor's appointments. He I promise, things, I promise, so we'll that's... have him back. That's, um, but not for this episode. We have prepared for you a short and interesting polar newsreel, as we do. And uh, let's just let's just kick this off right away with the first topic. We will be talking about. Uh, very old plants, um, an Antarctic expedition, temperatures and some science around that, um, holes in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. we yeah. have, we'll be uh, looking at a space-related topic and some interesting scallops. So let's kick mm -hmm. this off with the first one, which is a 32-year-old plant that has been No, no, revived. no, not 32, 32,000. Oh, 32,000 <laughs> years. Did I say 32 years? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so so scientists in Vienna are, are um, looking at sequencing the genome of an ancient flowering plant that is believed to have been buried 32,000 years ago by an Ice Age squirrel near the banks of the Kolyam, Kolyma River. Um, Siberia, right, Siberia. Yes, I guess. yes. So, so it's, you, a, it's, it's a seed cache. It's a, it's a yeah. squirrel that back then uh, dug down some seeds and forgot about them, as squirrels do. Yeah, but uh, don't you get the image of the film, the cartoon Ice Age? Of, uh, I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> of Scrat and I, uh, and the and the gland. There. <laughs> so so the thing is, yeah. I, I I've looked into this and I believe it's not new. This has happened a few years ago, so it's not a big news item. But it for some reason came up again in some news groups and people revived this, and it's still interesting because a thirty-two thousand year old plant um, is yeah, it's just something that you wouldn't expect to be happening because. We do some gardening here, and sometimes we have seeds that are three years old and they don't work anymore. So, doing that from a plant that is thirty or from a seed that is thirty-two thousand years old, I don't think they just put it in 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 soil. I think they had to do some DNA engineering and stuff. Well, in any case, what they uh, what is really interesting is that you have, of course, a a seed. I mean, the seeds are. Uh, protective capsule with the dna and some food uh, some some nourishment for the for the cells to to uh, to for the life for this plant to to propagate and to to vegetate but uh, i mean this is this is the silene stenophylla so this uh, this plant is a like a campions it's a it's a grass so it's not a uh, it's not it's not a huge tree that you'd imagine a sequoia or some of these uh, long-lived trees i mean it's a it's a grassland plant yep. and uh and it has to like germinate uh, normally after a winter so it like one uh, one covering with snow or 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 frost but here we are talking about a plant that has survived ice ages <laughs> and that has been buried under 20 40 meters below <laughs> the surface of yeah. the of the frozen soil of the <laughs> it's it's amazing so of yeah, course of course really the, the, one of the reasons they get they got access to this is because permafrost is kind of thawing. Re retreating it's thawing <laughs> and uh and uh, and what they want, of course, want to find out is if if it helps if what they learn from this plant might help to adapt uh other plants to more dry or more cold conditions. So, uh, in any case, I mean, getting since uh, since this is a is a plant that is always that is also present now. So you, we can compare the uh, genome of the plant as it was in that that particular individual of that plant, uh, that particular seed, as it was thirty two thousand years ago, and compare it to what is happened now. And we know how the climate has been. 
in in the in the inter, inter intervening years in between then and now so we know what kind of uh, we can we can use this i mean scientists can use this to understand how the climate has influenced the evolution of the genome so the recombination and things we're talking about the same species now and the same species 32,000 years ago hmm. that's fantastic wonderful Wonderful. Doesn't mm. happen too often, I guess. Um, yeah, and Arctic there, Today is a is a really nice, uh, really nice journal uh, for our online site. For are there any other to, organisms this old that have been revived? Do you know of any? Well, there was uh, uh, news. I, now I didn't put it up on the uh, on the newsreel here, but uh, there was an, a nematode, so a, a worm, a very a relatively simple worm that was uh, forty six thousand years old and uh, frozen into the permafrost, and it was still uh, uh, viable and alive. <laughs> and this we are talking about an animal, so it's even more difficult to yes. keep an animal that long, uh, considering it's. Uh, it's not. I mean, a seed is a is a survival capsule, while an animal alive. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, so there are uh, there are things, and there are also people that are thinking about this uh, for uh, cryopreservation. I mean, imagine the uh, science fiction uh, scenarios where people with incurable diseases are being uh, frozen, so that uh, deep frozen, so you can. With the, in the hope that somewhere mm -hmm. in the future they might be revived and cured of their incurable disease. Well, yeah, that's uh, also something. So you can find information about this also on uh, less uh, scientific sites. <laughs> Cryogenics, very interesting topic yes, for sure. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, let's come to the next topic, which is a bit of a different thing. Um has to do with what's going on in the east of Europe, in Ukraine right now. Yeah, and... Um, <clears throat> I mean, due to um, due to the war, uh, um, there are also problems uh, by reflection to the uh, Ukrainian uh, expeditions in uh, in Antarctica. Uh, Ukraine uh, bought, uh, I think it was last year, the old uh, James Clark Ross uh, icebreaker. Mm -hmm. So the research ship um, uh, James Clark Ross, and since the UK now have the Attenborough. Uh, they uh, eliminate or they sold this to to um, to Ukraine, and it was uh, uh, bought by the uh, National Antarctic Scientific Center. See, I wasn't I wasn't NASC. aware that the Ukraine was uh, doing Antarctic uh, expeditions. Yeah, and and that's that's really interesting because uh, they actually do have a station, a Vernadsky station, which was given in the nineties, I think, to uh, Ukraine, or it was handed over from uh, the British Antarctic Survey. All right. So the uh, Vernadsky station on the peninsula is, or uh, off the peninsula, is uh, a. Um, is a station where uh, it was called Faraday. And that's where the uh, a lot of the data on the the first data on the hole in the ozone layer was uh, sampled. It's a it's a very interesting station to visit. Um, I've been there a couple of times. They uh, are uh, extremely welcoming the scientists there, and uh, yeah. So uh, the problem now is that the noosphere, so the uh, the n new name of the James Clark Ross <laughs> is stuck in Punta Arenas. They were coming from Ukraine, from Odessa, and uh, across uh, the well, the Black Sea, and then the Mediterranean, and then the Atlantic, North and, uh, and South Atlantic, and they are in Punta Arenas in Chile. And they had to pick up a few extra scientists and to go down to Vernadsky and give the relay, I mean, exchange the crew that had been overwintering in Vernadsky or over summering and over wintering. So the, the people down in Vernaski have been there for 13 months now. And if they don't uh, get um, relief, uh, then they will have to spend uh, a little bit more time, possibly, which is uh, not uh, particularly nice. Hmm. Especially because now the Antarctic season also for tourist ships is coming to an end. So there are very few possibilities of getting out of there. Uh, Vernaski doesn't have uh, an airfield in the vicinity, so it's uh, it's difficult to come out of there uh, unless you have a ship. All right, let's hope for the best there. Yeah. 
Um, next up is some some science that I wasn't well I, I knew about but not in this context. So this is interesting. We're talking about uh, the oceans warming and how that will change sound travel and and how that yeah. will have an influence on on science. Yeah, we've had um, we had a few uh, a few episodes where we talked about uh, acoustics and the importance of sound uh, underwater. And uh, this we are not talking uh, now. We have uh, on on this uh, on this uh, piece on uh, fizz.org, uh, we have as a first uh, a right whale, for example, uh, as an example of animals uh, or plants that can be influenced by sound. But there are lots of animals and plants that can be influenced by sound underwater. Now, with the warmer ocean we also have a more dense ocean especially because warmer water wa wa well, sorry <laughs> warmer ocean warmer water means also more salty water and hmm. uh, and in this water is more dense so sound travels differently travels longer distances and uh, and and is more loud it's a little bit the difference of uh, of doing the same uh, clapping sound or just so in the, the air density or of the on medium a, on a table on the, a wooden table. The density of the medium influences the the travel times pretty much, and that will exactly certainly change measurements and things. Yeah, and it changes a lot of a lot of things. Uh, it changes also because uh, like some areas are getting warmer, but there are still cold. Uh, cold areas in the water. So there are going to be interfaces, uh, th um, thermoclines or uh, density clines in between warmer water, more dense and colder water, less dense. And, and these uh, will act as a little bit as a, as a filter or a reflective as or either as a mirror or as a filter for sound. We, we and, see the same in, in air, right? When the sun shines yeah. on the road and sometimes you see this uh, being like a mirage kind of thing. That yes. it's the, the same thing pretty much happens underwater with sound traveling. Yes, and, and we have uh, and the, yeah, the polarization of sound as well. But uh, the, the problem is here that when several sound sources concentrate, I mean, are traveling to the same place, you can also have concentration of sound in certain particular areas. So if you, for example, have two loudspeakers, I mean, if you are at home and you have your stereo set and you have two loudspeakers and they are synchronized, then you can have a point in the room, like a an, like an equilateral triangle, for example, if you see it from above, right. where you hear it stronger, where you hear a really good sound. And if you move a little bit to the side, you hear a little less. So this is concent a concentration of sound. And this can happen also in the ocean. So some areas are more loud than others already now but with the uh, with the increase in density in certain parts of the water mass these areas will change in location but also in intensity and we have to be aware of that when planning activities that make sounds so that does that mean that uh, in addition to making sound measurements you will you will have to correlate this with uh, salinity measurements with temperature measurements and correct for the 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 running exactly. the run times of your signals pretty much exactly so uh, it's just that uh, there is uh, there is a lot more than just knowing that the there is going to be an increase in temperature or decrease in temperature i mean changes in climate and changes in yeah. the weather i mean this, they, all these changes that they entrain a lot of other changes. As this is one extra thing. So these researchers that have published on the uh, one of the publications of the uh, American uh, Geological uh, Union and the DAGU, and uh, they have modeled the oceans, and they have found that there are several areas which are particularly which would be particularly subject to an increasing sound and uh, we're talking about uh, Greenland we're talking about the Barents Sea but also uh, a, a sector of the southern ocean between just south of uh, of Africa and eastward just south of uh, of um, Australia mm -hmm. and uh, and then several areas I mean there is an area that is in the Arctic Ocean that is below 500 meters depth because of course this is how how the water actually the water masses are moving water 
in the ocean is not homogeneously at the same temperature. You see it when you go on a lake uh, in, uh, <laughs> and you go swimming at the beginning of summer that on the surface the water is very warm, but then further down it's cold. <laughs> oh, as as <laughs> we saw in the in the uh, in the last episode, the air streams. Um, it's a very intricate system, and we exactly. have pretty much the same thing or yeah. a very similar thing in the oceans. We have different different streams that move uh, yeah. that have different um, properties. So protecting protecting areas of the ocean, like marine parks or marine protected areas, as we call them, uh, requires that one defines the areas which do not have any obvious physical features that delimit them. There are no mountains that limit the air. I mean, you can say the North Atlantic, of course, but then what about the, the equator? I mean, you can put a, an imaginary line there. But so if you want to to say, well, this area has to be protected, you have to take into consideration also these things. And uh, and this is one cool study that has uh, modeled the sound uh, and the soundscape and has found uh, acoustic hotspots for uh, for mitigating, for uh, helping mitigating sounds uh, in the ocean and, and the noise that can affect life in the ocean. Very interesting. So next up, we are... <laughs> okay, uh, Holes in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. I mean, <laughs> what what is happening here? That is linked, uh, I believe, to the permafrost thing again, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually quite a uh, quite a thing. I mean, there were a few articles. This is from the uh, World Economic Forum, and uh, and they are of course interested. In it. It's uh, as you see from the from the title, they are interested in the effects on the economy and things. Uh, that yeah, can we'll, happen we'll link that in the show change notes, of things. course. Yes, and. Uh, but this is about uh, some uh, research that was uh, made in the uh, Beaufort Sea, so north of the Canadian, uh, uh, of the Northwest Territory, the um, region of the Northwest Territories, and on the um, just off shore, so just off the uh, the coast on the um, on the shelf, and these scientists have gone in 2013 with uh, and they have measured uh, the seafloor like quite detailed and and very uh, and very uh, finely have uh, mapped the seafloor and then they went there uh, in 2017 and in 2019 and redid the mapping and they found that there are these like 200 meters 200 by by 100 meters and deep down 30 meters holes like areas of the seafloor that is slumped down Whoa. and and they they were quite intrigued about this uh, about this uh, this phenomenon so in in uh, on land when you have a sinkhole that usually happens because there were some some water under it um kind of uh, flushing out material and then it cracks in is that a similar mechanism yeah. Yes, but uh, I think that uh, I mean, if we uh, if we go to the uh, to the actual paper, and uh, now you are you are showing it on the on the screen, it's from the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, and it's a uh, PNAS as we call it, and uh, it's uh, it's a free article. I mean, open uh, uh, open access article, so anybody can see that, and it's quite well written. So even for non geologist, uh, um, it's uh, it's quite. Uh, quite understandable accessible so we have um, in this area an area uh, th this area is an area that was emerged in the Pleistocene so it has been emerged during the ice ages and it has had some permafrost and it still has some permafrost and uh, but the permafrost is not I mean is is, is a layer that has uh, uh, melted or uh, has had some deformations and uh, in the figure that we are seeing here is a, is a, is a section of the uh, of the um, continental uh, slope so we have the continental shelf flat more or less with a permafrost and then the continental shelf drops down to the deep ocean and then we have the continental slope there now between at the, at the corner let's say at the upper corner there where where the where there is a flexing down of the seafloor there is a, a, a an upward uh, layer of of material that is coming up 
and is delimitating the permafrost from the seafloor material. And this is a layer that can transport water and, uh, and, and liquids. So the, the melting of the permafrost creates this flow of water that you were saying you're we talking about and transports it up or lets it flow out. So it is a washing out of uh, things pretty yeah. much happening there. It is a washing out, but the mechanism that they are explaining here, that they are postulating, is similar to the formation of pingos. Have you heard about that before? Pingos? Pingos? Yeah. I pingo know what penguins is, are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> pingu, pingo. Pingos are uh, special glacial topographic forms. They are hills that are forming in glacial uh, landscapes where there is a uh, where there is permafrost and water accumulates in a lens and creates a hill mm -hmm. so it's where the where the terrain is is raised in a hill up to 70 meters tall actually sometimes very small sometimes uh, long but but where there is a lens of ice in like a like a, a layer of ice, like a, a, a cream in a pastry <laughs> filling yeah, yeah, in I there, but the, but the cream is the ice. And, and this happens also in that part of the seafloor where the continental plateau actually slopes down to the seafloor. So you have this layer of material below the permafrost that transports the water and facilitates the formation of pingos underwater. When these melt, then the sinkhole is formed. And these melt, probably the researchers that, are, uh, that, are, uh, that have written this uh, study, that have written up this study, they postulate that this is a long-term cycle. So it's nothing to do with short-term warming of the climate like we're having, we're experiencing okay. now. So it's not the couple of hundred years. It's, it's, a, it's a process that is much longer but it's extremely interesting to see how this is a confounding factor <laughs> if you want it. It, it it it's an overlay on it doesn't really help let's put it the, that way <laughs> on the anthropogenic climate change so you have already <sighs> some cycles of climate as we have had and of course like some detractors of of a man-made climate change that say yeah but it's really natural yeah okay yeah cl climate change is natural and this is probably one of those phenomena that happens also naturally that happens like because uh, independently of human presence and actions but this is coming on top of what is also the man-made climate change. The article also has a lot of information about, uh, for example, uh, water uh, density and uh, temperatures in there. So it's, it's a very nice little article if you want to have an approach to uh, this, uh, this phenomena uh, of uh, the uh, underwater permafrost in the Canadian Arctic and the creation of these large sinkholes. All right, so now we have a topic coming up that, again, is um, that's, that's pretty much down my, my alley because it is a space-related topic, but of course it's also Earth-related. It's uh, some science being done from satellites, and it has to do with the sea. This is... A study that was uh, it's actually a modeling exercise that was made by the researchers of uh, an expert center in barcelona it's a barcelona expert center at the uh, institute of marine scientists institute de ciencia del mar in uh, in barcelona and they have looked at they've taken data from a satellite by the european space agency called smos smos so the soil Most moisture ocean salinity satellite which is a a very specialized satellite. So that you looks can at measure salinity of the sea from yes. a few hundred <laughs> miles up there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Amazing. You can make that, and uh, and it's it's really amazing. It's um, it's a satellite that looks at uh, microwave, uh, like remote sensing. So it looks at microwaves that are emitted by the. Uh, by the surface or by the surfaces it observes. So it's a passive microwave remote sensing is called. So it captures the electromagnetic energy that is emitted by the surfaces. <laughs> and, and this is, of course, uh, a satellite, uh, as I said in the name, for soil moisture. So when it is over land, 
according to the the uh, the emission from the surfaces you can see if there is more or less moisture uh, on the surface and also if there is or not uh, I mean what level of salinity there is in the uh, in the sea so that's uh, that's that sounds all very very nice but they made this model but uh, you know the issues that they've had and uh, and uh, which of course they overcame came a little bit with some exercises is that once you make a model you need to see if the model actually is related to reality if so it confirms what a, what the reality does yeah, yeah. so you you take all data and you see for example if you're in this case predicting predicting salinity uh, and and looking at uh, the circulation based on the salinity so on the density on the how heavy the the water is which connects us to the other subject with acoustics yeah um you want to take all data about from the satellite and data about the salinity on site that is at the same time as the as the as a model that you are running and uh, so they took data from uh, from these things called argos floats so uh, oceanographers they put uh, out at sea some buoys they are called argos floats because they are they have the possibility of transmitting via the Argos system, transmitting data back. Oh, to, so they measure and then send the information back yeah. that they and, that they and measure. so and and these these are like salinity. You can measure it with different methods, but typically is measured with a CTD, so conductivity, mm -hmm. depth, and temperature, uh, and uh, a sensor like uh, an electronic sensor that then can give a salinity measure measure. Uh, derive measure and and this is sent back and they checked all of this and uh, and and it's actually quite interesting that they they had some pretty good results in how in their model and the model which is in the uh, in the um, extra material here you can read an article this is slightly more <laughs> It's slightly more detailed, so there are not that many pictures and a There's lot of formulas. A lot of formulas. Uh, scrolling <laughs> of formulas. through that is, uh, <laughs> is an so. exercise so, in patience for me. <laughs> so, so exactly. No, it's it's not really some uh, some light reading for <laughs> just before going to pictures. bed. But they have pictures. They also uh, have pictures. This but there are some pictures, and they looked at how the model, how good the, the model fits the data, and uh, models can also be not only used for understanding the functioning of a system but uh, they may be used in the future for a, for a prediction of currents and if we are predicting the current we are also predicting the uh, for example transport of heat to and from different areas of the ocean so quite quite interesting quite important all done in the uh, pleasant city of barcelona oh nice all remote uh, so so the so the acoustics topic that we had earlier th that is data that they can then use to validate their so that data is shared with them pretty much yes because i mean we don't have data uh, like measurements from all over the globe right uh, that like uh, directly like salinity measure from all over the globe direct salinity measures but we can have a satellite coverage right. over the surface How deep and we can make measure? a model how deep can oh, that just, measure? It's just they, surface, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the other that's the other thing. I mean, they, you measure from a satellite, you measure the surface or just below the surface. Yeah. So it's important to also have some caveats here. Sometimes the ocean is shallow, like in the Barents Sea, and sometimes the ocean is really deep, yeah. like for example, north of Iceland. And then uh, it is important to have this, like in in a model, you have to take into consideration that <laughs> and. Uh, like it, it, there is still need for going down with a with a probe and take a uh, how do you call it a, a vertical profile mm -hmm. every now and then. Uh, satellites are not going to be putting uh, uh, hands-on oceanographers on ships off the job. No, not yet. Well, <laughs> let's round this newsreel up with scallops. <laughs> yes, it's uh, almost lunch. So, <laughs> or. <laughs> <laughs> one one could think uh, uh, scallops yeah well i found this particularly interesting um it's a, there were some divers it's scallops that, yeah. that it's, it's it's related to ice and scallops and that is a exactly. interesting so combination. we're talking 
Imagine you're down in Antarctica and you're a diver at uh, McMurdo, uh, so like in a pretty cold area, and you're going down and you're seeing that there are some areas of the seafloor, not very deep, that where where there are some beds or scallops of these animals. I mean, mm-hmm. they are mollusks in like bivalves, so like shell, and and these do not have ice over them. But uh, we talked about it also before when we saw the uh, ice fishes, for example, that there are some areas that are extremely cold. I mean, they are super cooled water, so water that is not frozen yet. But if something happens, like a grain of sand falls through that then it Su- just freezes so. super cool liquids yeah super cool liquid i had and this these... i had this with a bottle of a, of a drink that i had in the freezer and forgot and yeah. i took it out it was was just water and it was still liquid and then you move it a little and it goes foomp, and it freezes foomp. within seconds yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing and uh, and you can see uh like in the uh in the actual uh, study here which is uh, uh it's well, in nature it is, magazine uh, report in in nature and it's also an open access um, paper and it's really really interesting Um, the scientists uh, from uh, the uh, Max Planck Institute in in Mainz uh, they took this challenge they said like okay these divers have seen these scallops they are Adamusium kolbeki it's a scientific name and it appears to remain ice-free, also in shallow water. And here we see uh, in the picture that you're showing from the magazine um, in the uh, B uh, pane, you can see that there is some sea ice on the surface and then the seafloor on the bottom. And in between the two are connected by what is called the anchor ice. So there is some super cooled water that is then frozen and it's, it, it connects the sea ice to the seafloor. Mm-hmm. And these scallops they can live in the anchor ice so with the ice conditions in there they also saw that uh, uh, not all of them actually actually of these adamusium kolbeki scallops can survive this water here so there are some that are colonized on the surface by sponges that grow on the actual shell and these actually die when the ice is is growing on them because the ice actually grows on them instead of just slipping off. So, uh, well, it's not really easy to figure out how they did, how, how they do this, the scallops, but then the researchers, they made a little experiment and they also looked at the surface of the scallops and they saw, and they, they did these experiments in a laboratory. So they took some scallops from our climates from temperate climates and these Antarctic scallops, very similar uh, shells, but the structure on the surface is different, and uh, they don't have mu- the the uh, the temperate uh, species do not have some spatial some some, some radial micro ridges. So there are some different levels of ridges of, of material on the surface. But these Antarctic scallops have some micro valleys on the shell. These and are microscopic uh, structures. You don't really ex- see them that clearly. Yeah. I mean, the, the valley from like, you have like ridges and valleys and the, the wavelength is about 20 micron. Yeah, so that's not much. two tenths of a, of a millimeter, and and they are five micron in height. So they are like if you pass your finger over them, you don't feel the difference, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can see them on the microscope. And uh, and if you uh, if you go to the next picture where there is a uh, a picture of uh, the uh, a scheme or a drawing of the experiment, they put the uh, Antarctic scallop and uh, a base scallop. Uh, in super cool conditions, and they've seen that in the Antarctic scallop, the ice crystals begin to form on the peaks of these ridges. And the valleys, they still maintain salt water. So the ice forms almost like, like a shield, but is detached from the actual shell because it floats on the ridge on the to- on the tips of the so, of the mountains there of the of the ridges so the ice is more of a protective layer or has a protective yes, it, layer in between the scallop and the ice then 
yeah, the the ice does not adhere to the shell in the same way because the uh, the base scallop instead has ice crystals forming all over. It has almost no ridges, even if the surface is uh, not uh, particularly smooth. But the ice forms and attaches everywhere. So instead of having ice forming and attaching ice crystals attaching all over the surface, the Antarctic scallop is this layer of water that stays even super cool but stays liquid below the ice so that the ice shell forming can then be detached but it's it's enough to have a little bit of current that the that the ice shell can actually falls off falls off <sighs> wouldn't it be nice to have something like this on the windscreens of your car <laughs> in the winter <laughs> like or, imagine this or you upgrade <laughs> you upgrade to an electric car and have a remote control to just thaw it before you leave <laughs> yeah. yeah but even even that because even in an electric yeah, right. car the less the less energy you use oh totally absolutely the better it is i mean the, the more you can travel i mean the less energy you use for for heating up the windscreen so so i think that this is uh, an example of where biomimicry could be or uh, like uh, uh, the uh, the concept of using nature solution for applications yeah. for humans is is actually it has a lot uh a lot to uh to our advantage because we could have for example on the on the hulls on the uh, on ships ships can get covered with ice oh if you go I've if you go in there and, i've like, been yeah, there you've yes. been there you've seen that yes imagine that the surface of the ship instead of being like totally nice and flat and the ice forming all over and being very well attached yeah. it actually just falls enough off just to just like it just sheds off because it doesn't attach to it yeah it's a little bit like teflon for uh, for uh, for cooking nature's, but, uh, nature's teflon there we go yeah but this is uh there is uh i mean it's calcium carbonate or or uh, aragonite in in shells so that's a, that's calcium a, that's and a, magnesium carbonate that's so a good title for this episode nature's teflon <laughs> All right, that concludes our yeah. Arctic newsreel, our Polo newsreel. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for being subscribed. Well, thank we are going to be back uh, next week. Uh, if you are on YouTube, make sure you you click all the subscribe buttons and the thumbs up and give us a like and uh, the things that we do, the things that uh, help us being seen here. Um, you can also find us at curiouslypolo.com where we have our website with all the episodes and there's of course Curiously Polar on Twitter we'll be back in a week from now until then everyone take care bye 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 bye